All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 25th day of December in the year of our Lord, 2023. So it's been over 2,000 years since he came. About time for him to come back, I think. And I want to talk, I've selected, I think, five scripture passages that are appropriate for today. And uh, I might make a correction in the Bible, in the English Bible. Because I think all the, uh, the there's basically two uh, literal translations. You have the of, of one. It's a very not a very significant change, but I think they just didn't get it. I think the translators erred a bit. It's not that it's a real issue, but I think I think when I show you this, you might understand better what is being said there. So um, this book is not the object of our faith. Jesus Christ is the object of our faith. This is God's Christmas present. This is the wrapping. Christ is the present. He is the gift of God. This talks about the gift of God. This has a label on it, from God to us. You have to open the package and discover the gift. So let's go to John 3.16 which is a very appropriate place to start. And uh, let's see if my mind is going to work this morning. There we go. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So this actually tells us a whole lot more than you think. Um, let me go back there. I didn't want to take that off. I wanted to switch. Switch over here. And un- unfortunately, I will get into the Greek a little bit. And there's some people that don't like that, but you have to realize a translation is a translation. Translations are never, uh, never carry the full meaning of the original. It's just a, there's never, there's no such thing as a one to one correspondence in words generally. So if anybody that's, that's tried to study a language, you already know that. But there's some people out there that, that get upset. I'm sorry. I will try to help you along here. But yes, you don't have to know the Greek. There's other ways to do this. Uh, prayer will work just fine, too, by the way. God will lead you. But I often find that God says, well, here, this is what Jesus actually said. Oh, yeah. That cures up, clears up the problem right there. Yes, Jesus did not speak English. Nobody back then spoke English because English didn't even exist. And we sh- you should know that like British English and American English aren't the same thing at all. We can understand each other, sort of, but... All right, so here, for God so loved the world. It has some interesting things in here. Uh, that I want to bring forth. and I mean, the, the English says it, but you just might not see it. For this is, this is about the manner in which God loved the world. Now, the interesting thing here, the thing I want to point out, is the word loved. The word loved. This is not a continuous tense. This is not a perfect tense. This is a simple past tense in English and in Greek, that generally indicates a simple past event, doesn't it? Like, he, this is not, he began loving. That is not really what it's saying here. But he, this is the manner in which God loved the cosmos, the world, his creation. 
is creation because salvation goes beyond just men. Uh, all creation was subject to futility because of man's fall, as the scripture says, as Paul says. And creation is longing for the revelation of the sons of man in their glory when Christ returns. That creation will, at that time, creation will be set free from its bondage to corruption. What we call in uh, physics the, the law of entropy or the second law of thermodynamics, that all things are decaying. And it's, uh, it's, so they'll be set free into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. In other words, we're not subject to physical laws at that point because we are made like unto Jesus. And he plans to redeem creation. That's why there has to be millennium people because Christ's task is to put all things back the way they're supposed to be, including creation. The devil will be a complete failure. There will not be anything that the devil has done that will not be undone because Christ will crush his hat. He's, it's, it's, it's like the, the, uh, the idol of Satan that put, was put in uh, the Capitol building in Iowa. Not only was Satan forced to stand there and look at the babe, metaphorically speaking, it's, it's like when they brought the Ark of the Covenant into the Canaanite temple and uh, the fish god, fell on his face and worshipped the the ark. Remember that? Yeah. The Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant, captured it, and brought it into their temple. It didn't work out well. So it's just like in Iowa. So they bring this this idol of Satan in there. Satan's well, most Satanists don't believe in the devil. They don't believe anything. They're really atheists usually. So they bring this, they create this Christmassy Bethlehemet with red crepe paper and tissue paper and a plastic shiny goat head on it. Looks like a Christmas tree ornament. And they put it in the state house next to the Christmas display. So, so, uh, so if an idol actually has anything to do with the connection with it, the one it's supposed to represent, so then Satan is forced to stand there motionless as as almost like a guard over the Christ child. <laughs> and then a man, a man comes along that apparently is not from the state. Like a somebody coming from someplace else comes and destroys the idol. Is that an image of something that's going to happen in the future? Yes, uh, the man, Christ, will return from heaven and crush the kingdom of Satan. And then finally, he'll, he'll be thrown into the, permanently into the lake of fire. But yeah, uh, just to rub it, is, is God just rubbing it in the nose of the devil? Mm -hmm. I think the devil gets the point. Did you get the point? <laughs> The very fact that they would they would make an idol, Bethlehemet, a gender confused humanoid goat headed thing that's supposed to represent the the highest perhaps what was the highest archangel, the highest creature of God. <clears throat> oh how you have fallen, O oh star of the morning. Uh -huh. Even your followers disrespect you. All right, so he's been brought low. Talk about rubbing in his nose right before Christmas. <laughs> Just to remind him, hey, you know that day that's coming up in a few days that everybody or most people... Uh, uh, <laughs> it's supposed to remind them of me, what I did, yeah. For God so loved the world. My point here is that this verb sort of indicates, I don't want to push this too far, but in Christ, not just with that verb, I mean the whole scripture indicates this, that this is the entire package of God's love to creation. It's all in Christ. 
Uh, it's all everything that God is doing, all his love toward the world is express, expressed in this singular event of giving his son to, to creation, to human beings, and to creation as a whole, the cosmos. This is God's response to Satan's activity in the garden. We're delayed a bit, but here it is. Bang, at the proper time, God gave his son. For God so loved the world that he gave, again, this is, indicates a singular completed event. It's past. He gave his, his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish. See, this is a purpose. The highest purpose in God giving his son was that all those who would believe in him, just simply believe in him. That's all you have to do. Believe, trust in him should not perish, shall not be lost to God, but shall have everlasting life. It's a free gift that God gives. God gave the gift of eternal life to all those who will trust and believe in him. That's it. There is not a religion that man has ever thought of that even approaches this. So when you want to talk to a Muslim or a Jehovah's Witness or a or a Mormon, or an atheist. This is all you need. So God gave his son, into the, sent his son into the world in order that rather than perish, you would have eternal life. And all you have to do is trust him. Sounds pretty easy, doesn't it? That's all that God requires. Some people want to make it more difficult. I mean, you have to truly trust him, not simply imagine it or say some words. No, real trust. And then God does the rest. So this is this is the, the what we're celebrating today, unless you're Orthodox, and I think it's in the 7th of, of January. I forgot that wrong. Forgive me, please. I, your calendar's not the same one we have here. In fact, I would am almost considering in the future celebrating Christmas on the 7th simply to avoid what the devil has done to Christmas on the 25th. It's the result of a calendar change. The Pope Gregory changed the calendar, and that was after the Great Schism. So the rest of the, the Christian world said, no, calendar needed to be fixed. All right, let's go on to another scripture. But remember, this is, so this is like a completed gift. It's not an ongoing process. He gave his son. Now, his son is the one at work in this world. Because he's the one that made it. He created it. It's his cosmos. So let's go on to another scripture here. And this is one. So when he comes into the world, so there's some uh, shepherds out in the field, and an angel appears to them and says, uh, for this day there is, is born to you this day in the city of David, that's Bethlehem, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The Lord, that's Christ God, the Lord. Adonai, Elohim. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in the manger, in a manger. And immediately... There was, an, um, uh, there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to men. Now, there's another scripture that talks about this, but I want to show you something I think is not properly translated, and it's verse 13 here. And it says here, you know, the, the, no, 14. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. 
I, I, the uh, the King James and New King James translate on peace on, on earth peace goodwill toward men. The uh, critical text, the New American Standard and the ESV both translate it. Uh, well, a New American Standard translated on earth peace among men with whom you are well pleased. Well, first of all, the reason God sent a Savior into the world is because he was not well pleased with men. He sent him to save sinners. So I don't th do not think this is a proper translation. And the ESV says, on earth peace among those whom, uh, with whom he is pleased. No, God did not send his Son into the world to save the righteous, but to save sinners. If, if God is well pleased with you, you are already justified in God's sight. So, no, he's not pleased with sinners. That's why he sent a Savior. If he was well pleased with men, it wouldn't be necessarily to send, send a Savior. So this is a, is a, a, a translation. I don't know why they came up with these translations. Uh, <clears throat> it's, they're man-centered. Um, okay, so when we look at the actual language here, Let's see if there. Uh, let's see, genitive singular, nominative. Oh yeah, I think the critical text is an error too. Uh, the BGT is critical. It, it, this is a genitive. Uh, well, I'd have to actually check my my chart to make sure on that. But this is a, these are nouns. The goodwill is a noun. Uh, so I think it, what they what they got wrong here. In both cases, it reads an anthropois, which means uh, this is two, but also an, uh, which is a very broad meaning. But it means among, or in, or among. So the the gift is. The goodwill is given uh, in among men. So they have that right among men or toward men because it's in the data. It can, it can be rendered either way. But goodwill is not a verb. It's a noun. And the other thing is peace here is a noun. And it's... So it's glory to God in the highest. And we'll see something in another verse that it says, these are angels worshiping the, the babe. So they are saying to the babe, not to the father, to the son, glory to you, God in the highest. This is about they're worshiping him the babe in the manger, and they're saying to him, God, glory to you, O God, in the highest. Do you get that? And I'll prove it in a minute. And on earth, where is he located? He's on earth. He's been born a man. He's in a manger wrapped, wrapped in swaddling clothes. And they say, and on earth, peace. So he's God in the highest, and on earth he is peace. And he, he is goodwill among and toward men. He himself, the, the peace and the goodwill and God in the highest is Christ himself. If someone says I'm not getting something in the Greek, properly. Go ahead and show me. Um, but it's still, and I'll show you some other scriptures that's consistent with this idea. So the, Christ himself is the gift of God. God giving himself into a fallen world and a fallen creation in order to restore it and to give the devil a big chop in the mouth. Crush his head, in fact. Yeah, you'll strike his heel, but he will crush your head. That goes back to when? The Garden of Eden. God's promise to Satan. You're going to get yours. 
and where I'm going to undo everything you've done. And that's what's going on here. That's why he sent himself into the world. So here, let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 1 here, starting at verse 1. God, who at various times in various ways spoke in, um, in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. Or I imagine that is also in his, yeah, in, in his Son, by his Son, through his Son whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, the ages. Which is what it really says, ages. It's an artifact of the King James there. or artifact of English, really, who being the brightness of his glory, God's glory, the brightness of glory and the express image of his person, the incarnate Son is the express image of Almighty God. If you want to see God, look at Christ in the flesh. You've seen God. As he himself said when Philip asked him, show us the Father and Jesus responds, Philip, have I been so long with you and you do not know me? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And upholding all things by the word of his power, why does everything continue to exist? Because Christ upholds it by, by his word. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten thee. This is talking about the Incarnation. This is not talking about um, a hypothetical eternal begetting because it says today. That's a time expression. The so-called eternal begetting is timeless. It's, it doesn't have a, it's not an event. So, oh, theology. The Bible doesn't teach that, so you don't have to worry. About it. But here, here it says today. I have begotten thee. Why? Because he's begotten as a man. The he's begotten of God uh, into a human body, which is truly of man because it's of the seed of the woman, which means, modern language, an egg. All he had to do was add an X chromosome to it and say, run. Now, God can do that. The idea, by the way, this is related to the, the Catholic idea of the, uh, um, the Immaculate Conception of Mary. This is not referring to the Immaculate Conception of the Son of God. This is they say Mary herself was immaculately conceived. Now that is blasphemy. Uh, Mary, Christ was born of a natural human being because he had to be fully and properly man, and anything else of an unnatural nature would not be right. So even though he was he had no earthly father, uh, he was born of the human race through this act of begetting God, the Son, in Mary of her flesh. But he's not born of Adam. He's born of Mary. 
So he was not born. There was no human male involved. So who was guilty of the sin in the garden? Who willingly did what he did? It was Adam. Adam was the one to blame for it. But the uh, the Catholic idea is, well, Christ couldn't have been conceived in an imperfect vessel. Well, then Mary couldn't have been conceived in an imperfect vessel either. This is just silliness. It's human nonsense. Don't listen to the—believe the Scriptures. Don't believe what the opinions of men, including me. If I don't agree with the Scriptures, if I add something or subtract something that's, that's not— you know, I'll try to explain Scriptures, but if I'm going off into some not our world— don't pay attention to me. At that point, you should unsubscribe. For which of the angels did he say, for you are my son, today I've begotten the seed. Here, too, is where I think we have the idea of, of the sonship of God coming in, too, because he says later here, uh, this is, these are quoting from, the, from Isaiah. This isn't the, the writer of Hebrews making this up. He's quote, quoting from the Old Testament prophets. And he, is, uh, he also says, uh, and I shall be a father to you, and you shall be a son to me. So the, the father-son relationship, properly th speaking, I think, uh, is related to his incarnation as the Son of God. Uh, John begins in his gospel saying, in the beginning was the word, the logos, and the and the Word was with God, and the word, word was God, and then he becomes the Son when he's incarnate. Then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that's when he, the relationship of Father and Son really takes on the, the, a biblical meaning there, I think. He, he truly becomes, he com, becomes the second Adam. The first Adam was called the Son of God, too, but he was Son by creation, the second Adam is son by God begetting him of a human. Um, uh, so it is God begetting himself into a human body through the seed of the woman. God can do that. So he takes on actually true human flesh, but he doesn't take on the sinfulness of human beings, which apparently is passed on by the male, perhaps? The X chromosome, it has to be more than chromosomal. I mean, that's uh, it, uh, evil. The, the uh, original sin is the absence of God in us. That, that we're born without the presence of God in us. That's the real issue. It's not some sort of a positive wicked force. God didn't create that. How can how could God create something evil? He didn't. It's a lack of God. It's a lack of His presence. I'm not the only one that has speculated on that. It's not too difficult to demonstrate from the Scripture. In other words, it's uh, even Satan. What's wrong with Satan? Satan turned inward. He turned away from God to himself. He, instead of glorifying God, he started to glorify himself. He exalted himself. So what was good became evil because he severed that proper relationship with God. That's what evil is. It is a creature that is no longer in proper relationship with God. Sin isn't something that exists apart from sinful creatures. It is disobedience. It's rebellion. It only exists in creatures. It can't exist in, uh, in, an, in moral beings. There has, it has to be something that is deliberately chosen. And then once you choose that, you're sort of stuck because you've cut yourself off from God. God has to restore you to the relationship. You can't restore yourself. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, uh, firstborn here, prototokos, is... Uh, uh, we get the word prototype from it, by the way. It is the, the firstborn of what? Of many brethren. So God's idea is to restore the, entire, the human race to 
its proper state, what it should be, or at least those who trust in Christ. So we will be, we are the firstborn when Christ, re, or he is the firstborn of many brethren when Christ returns, we will be glorified together with him, his people. A particular special people, but not the only people. The, there will be nations uh, besides us, but those who have trusted in Christ, when he comes back, we will be his nation, a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, a special people. We will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. So the scripture said, these people that, that discard the millennium, well, they're not doing it on a biblical basis. They're doing it on the basis of a of their own imaginations and listening to people like Augustine. It says, but to which of the angels that, uh, has he, uh, of the angels, he says, who makes angels, his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire or servants, uh, worshipers. Actually, that's a, um, that's not like a deacon. But to his son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The righteous, uh, a scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. And he says, God says to the, the son here, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. And you, Lord, Yahweh, this is quoting from the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, it's, it's Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed, and, but you are the same, and your ear, ears will never fail. He goes on. All quotations from the Old Testament, I think Isaiah. All, I think they're all from Isaiah. Now, now he says here, the angels let them worship him. So that's why I say in Two here in uh, Luke two fourteen, it should be translated that way, that in, with a, a more clarity than it is, because Christ is God in the highest. Even on earth, He is still seated in heavenly places, at the right hand of the Father. His body is here, but He's there. It's there's not. He is both God and man. So their their worship the the God man is the the angels are told to worship the God man, and what they're doing is say glory to God to you God in the highest. And you are, on earth, the peace. God's salvation. He is Christ the Savior. Peace for men. And God's attitude toward man. The goodwill of God toward sinful man. See, this is a noun. It's not a verb. He, Christ, is the goodwill of God toward the cosmos, toward creation, toward men. Sinners. So this... this uh, Modern translation base that, that goes uh, a goodwill toward men with whom he is well pleased is simply wrong. That's not the idea because Christ came to save sinners. That's what happens when transla translators, well, they, they do err. Christ is God's goodwill. He is the gift of God. He is the Savior. And it's in him. It's all in him. He is the creator. Everything is wrapped up in Christ. And so that's why I say Christianity is Christ. The idea you could have a vicar of Christ is absolutely impossible. 
impossible. It's blasphemous to even consider that idea. How, how can Pope Francis be the substitute for Jesus Christ, the creator of all things, the savior of, men, of sinners, the goodwill of God toward creation, God's goodwill encapsulated in Christ, the Son, God's love encapsulated in Christ, the Son, God himself in Christ, the Son, all of God, the Trinity, the whole Trinity is encapsulated in Christ, too. Because the angels worship him. Glory to in the highest to you, O God, the babe in the manger. Now, the angels were told or commanded to worship him. Question, was Satan commanded to worship him, too? And his fallen angels? Would God do something like that to the devil? Here, here. See, see this little babe here? As I grab hair, Satan by his hair and rub his nose in it. See him? You know what he's going to do to you? I told you what he's going to do to you. Remember what I said in the garden? Worship him or else you must worship him. Your needs will bend. I declare it. <laughs> Hmm. Interesting possibility, isn't it? So if God said, let all the angels of God worship him, would Satan have a choice? No. No. One could say, well, the angels of God. Well, God created them. Christ created them. They have to worship their creator, if nothing else. So here, again, let's go Hebrews. That's, you can go on. You, you need to read this. Please read Hebrews. It's so, it is so wonderful. Oh, the New Testament's all so wonderful. Colossians. Starting at verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 13, starting here. This is all about Christ. When Christmas is supposed to be all about Christ, look at what the world has done to it. Uh, of course, the world is under the control certain, occur, currently of Satan. Why do you think Satan has created all this junk to distract us from worshiping the one we're supposed to worship? Oh, yes. He has, it's like to, you know, I fought my whole Christian life against Christmas, as it is. It's, uh, the resistance have, has been futile so far. And I will today, I'll go over to my my son's house and my daughter will and their family, my son's-in-law, my, my kids, all of them, will be there and my grandkids, and they'll try to give me some presents, and I'll say, please don't do this. You know I don't want this stuff. It's supposed to be about Christ. But it will have no effect. I'll just sort of roll my eyes and thank you. You, you can't... F We're waiting for Christ to come back, and then he'll fix the world because it requires more than what we're able to do in our flesh. Although I think we can do a lot more than we think about many things. You know, I, I had a thought this morning. Yesterday, we, uh, we went for a drive. It was a nice afternoon. So we drove by the nursing home where, where we had done worship service for, for uh, well, how many years? I don't know, seven, eight years or more until COVID came along. And the place is a is a desolation. It is uh, it is empty. Uh, there's still lights on in the building, but it is uh, 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 tree branches laying all over the place, weeds, everything. It is no maintenance done on it. It is just desolate. I mean, it's not an ancient building either. It was built in the 
probably about 1970 or so. Still a modern building. They needed to put new windows in it or something, but only because they were, you know, not, not energy efficient and they were starting to get a little cloudy. It's not like they were broken or anything. But they had sold, the county had sold it off. They pushed for years. The county accountants wanted to get rid of it because they had milked it for everything they could and used the funds, the profits that had come from the nursing home to spend on other things. And then when the home needed maintenance, they wanted to dump it. Now, I think a community has responsibility for people in the community. And uh, uh, so I think it's a proper function of local government, especially a county government. That used to be standard operating procedure. Counties had a county nursing home, a not-for-profit nursing home. And it was the responsibility of the people that live there to take care of their, of their people. And that is a godly thing. But I was, when I, as I was thinking about that this morning, I wonder if that place would still be desolate if there were still Christians that were going there and praying for them and, and concerned. But they had, the county had abrogated their responsibility when they sold it off to investors. Capitalism is wickedness in certain places. It has its place, but it must be constraint. Unconstrained capitalism is just satanic. It is powered by sin. Greed, it's what powers it. And that's why it's successful, because it's powered by sin. In a sinful world, that makes it successful. But it has to be con contained and controlled. Um, and of course, it wasn't that long ago, there were no such things as uh, corporations in the modern sense dating back to about the time of Abraham Lincoln is when such things were invented. They're unconstrained. They need to be uh, not afforded human rights, not afforded personhood. It's a legal fiction. That's what it is. A creature of the state. So they dissolve when the state dissolves. So. Uh, what happens if you have a revolution? Do all the corporations cease to exist because they have no corporate charge or charge? They have no legal uh, existence anymore. You ever think about that? Like the currency, unless it's silver and gold or something real, it just gone. Like Confederate dollars. But that nursing home, it's it's like okay, you take the love of God out of things, you take. Our responsibilities to, to God out of things. Uh, you just discard it and give it to in private investors who are just interested in making money, and what do you end up with? Desolation, ruin. Not that I'm sure nursing homes have a future anymore after the pandemic. Uh, they turned out to be places of death, but I suspect... The Christians should have been praying more about the people that were there because God is not limited by human ability. So let's go here in uh, Colossians chapter 1. For he, has, for he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. Jesus is the love of God to the world. The son of his love. Of course, he loves the son, too. God loves himself, too. He has to. If God loves what is good, he has to love himself above all things, because only God is good. That has, that's the one case where self-love is good. It's sinful for creatures to love themselves above their creator. But God, because of his nature of being love and loving righteousness— has to love himself. That's a good thing. It just sounds weird, doesn't it? In whom we have redemption in the Son of his love, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God. He alone, him singularly, is the image of the invisible God. All, the only true image of the invisible God. In his flesh. Jesus in his flesh. The image of God. 
the firstborn of all creation. Uh, the firstborn there is related to his. Uh, um, uh, it, it's it's a sense of well, that's Prototokos again. Uh, this is uh, the firstborn in the sense of uh, primacy. Primacy, like the firstborn son, is the, in the position of primacy over everything else. So he is not only the creator, he is also of the creation, and he's the firstborn. That We have this, this strange thing in Christ, both cre creature and creator. The union of God and his creation in Christ. And when we talk about Christ, we talk about his, uh, him being, too, fully God and fully man. One person. And we find that him uniting his self as creator and creature together in one person also. This is uh, the, an amazing thing that is beyond our capacity to, to, to really speak about it too much or think about it too much. For by him, not the Christ, all things were created that are in heaven and are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones and dominions and principalities or powers. These are like angelic powers, like the uh, the the four. What do you call them? That that uh, that worship around the throne, the one with the head of the lion and the one with the head of a, an eagle and an ox, and you know some people. All oh, those are the four gospels. Baloney. Those are powers and principalities, dominions. That they are spiritual creatures made by God. All things were created through him and for him. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, Christ is. That in him all things he may have a preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. That he is for, has a preeminence in everything, including the resurrection, including of creation, including of, of deity. He is... Uh, uh, manifest deity, a revealed deity. Christ is the revelation of God. He is the perfect image of God. He is God made manifest. He is before all things, and in him all things consist, hold together. And by him, all the fullness should dwell in by him, verse 20, to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having been made peace through the blood of his cross. Then he goes on to talk about us individually. And you who are once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet he has now reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. This is what Christ has done for us. Lastly, Hebrews 20, uh, 2, 9. But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, reduced to man for the purpose of the suffering of death, that he might make atonement for our sin. Crowned with glory and honor, that, by, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man.
for it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things. So all things are for Christ, for the Son, and all things are by him, the Creator, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. So he has partaken of our flesh, of our sufferings, all these things, to be, to sum all things up in himself. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For this reason he is not ashamed to call them us brethren. That's what Christmas is all about. That's just a little expansion of, in the Word of God, of, for God so loved the world. He loved the world in this manner, as a package, past event, that happened that day in the birth of his son. that all these things are encapsulated in Christ, the God-man who was born into the world. And when he was born into the world, all the angels of God worshipped him. Glory to you, O God in the highest, to you who are peace, the Prince of Peace, to you who are the good will of God toward men. Merry Christmas and glory to God in the highest.